number of people logging in over this 21. Good evening and welcome to our ninth annual Ladies' Night Out event. We're so glad you're here. This is our first time going virtual, so we appreciate you bearing with us that, that we can't be in person tonight. Um, slides will be available on our website from tonight's presentations and will also be sent out in the email, the follow-up email rather, uh, later on in the week. I'd like to kick things off by thanking our co-presenting sponsors for a step, Amerigroup, a longtime supporter of Summit Pacific and Ladies' Night Out. Um, Amerigroup helped package and hand out our beautiful gift bags for our 150 live participants. Thank you so much, Amerigroup. Thank you also to our other co-presenting sponsor, Vaughn Company, longtime supporter of Ladies' Night Out. Thank you, Vaughn. Again, we're so glad you're here. 
I hope you find some tips and tools to help you on your wellness journey. Um, there will be quite a few speakers tonight with a, a wide variety of topics. Um, hope you find them interesting. I'm Emily Dillingham, your host for the evening. I'm also the director of the Foundation and Community Development here at Summit Pacific Medical Center. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to kick things off with our education sponsor, United Healthcare, who are presenting on how to build connection during COVID. We have four speakers this evening. I'll introduce them one by one. Jenna Bowman is United Healthcare's Washington State Tribal Liaison. Jenna is a member of the Tulalip Yakima Tribe. Welcome, Jenna. Stacy Lopez is Behal the Health behavioral clinical manager for Washington. Stacy has been working in Washington for the past 25 years in the publicly funded mental health system and has two children in college. Welcome, Stacy. Mandy Harriet is the maternal health program coordinator for United Healthcare. She is completing graduate studies for her master's in nursing. Her passion is helping women have planned, healthy, happy pregnancies. In her free time, she loves to explore Washington forests and beaches with her family and friends. Thank you so much for being with us, Mandy. And lastly, we have Nikki Jones, Behavioral Health Addiction Administrator. She is a lifelong Washingtonian, and Nikki spends her free time losing herself in her books, camping, and hiking scenic trails of Washington. Welcome, Nikki. So Jenna's going to start us off. Hachacho Oste Itza, Jenna. Um, as an indigenous person, I've spent a large amount of time navigating our traditional trading routes. When we landed on the territory of another tribe, we always acknowledged the land we were on and showed our respect by honoring those traditional lands. In respect for my traditional ways, I would like to begin this meeting in a good way. This is a way for us to come together with a common heart and mind to bind, bind us in a common thread and focus on what helps to continue to build bridges. Today, we'll begin by recognizing the land we're on through a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that this virtual meeting is taking place throughout the Coast Salish Territory of Washington State, which is home to over 29 tribal nations in present day. My current location is near the Tulalip Reservation, who signed the, their treaty under duress, which is the Treaty of Point Elliot. As we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all of our indigenous people have shown worldwide. Tsiguasi. Thank you, Jenna. So, hi ladies. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Stacy Lopez, and as Emily said, I am a social worker. I've been working in Washington for the last 25 years. And I just want to start off by saying that um, as women everywhere, I want to acknowledge everything that you do. I have two kids who are in college right now, and I cannot imagine being at home and working and homeschooling my kids if they were younger. So I am amazed by everything that you do at this point. So here's to you, ladies. Um, we wanted to talk about building connections during COVID. And when we got started thinking about that, we wanted to talk about uh, behavioral health and maintaining your mental health during COVID. And we wanted to talk about how to stay healthy, happy, and strong, and how to know when you're in trouble and, and what to do when you think you might need some help. So I wanted to start off with the idea that as women, we're a lot of times the pillar of our families and that we work, we raise kids, we partner, we support our parents, we participate in our community. And so just like an oxygen mask in an airplane, you have to put your own ox oxygen mask on first, right? So they always say that and you think about it and you think, well, could I do that? But yes, in fact, I think it's time we put our own oxygen masks on and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. Um, so ways in which you can keep yourself healthy. One of, the, one of the best ways to keep yourself healthy and strong is to manage your stress. Stress is really hard on every level. It's hard for our emotional health. It's hard for our physical health. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the very easy, 
It's not easy. None of these are necessarily easy. But one way we can uh, help ourselves is to take a time out. So I think about this. You could practice yoga. You could listen to music. You could meditate, get a massage. I don't know if you can get a massage right now, actually, but maybe. Um, you know, if you must, go in the bathroom for five minutes. Shut the door. Just take a time out so you can recenter and then go back and engage in what you need to do. Um, some of those are very short-term little interventions and some of them are longer, but any little break you can create for yourself is going to be helpful. Uh, the second thing is eat well-balanced meals. Again, um, try not to skip meals. This, this helps you stay well-balanced. It helps you uh, uh, keep your kids well-balanced if you're managing them all day, every day at home. And I like to say this is over the long run, right? Give yourself some grace if one day dinner is, you know, um, mac and cheese and ice cream sundaes. There was this one famous day in my house where we had ice cream sundaes for dinner. It only happened once and my kids still talk about it. Um, it, it just because we could. And so, you know what, that day we all needed a little break. So we did. Generally, we eat broccoli, but that day was different. Um, Try to limit alcohol and caffeine. Alcohol and caffeine both can aggregate, uh, aggravate anxiety and stress and trigger panic attacks if, you, if um, you're prone to that. So just always try and manage that well. If you can get some exercise during the day, that's a good thing. This is one, you can do this with your kids if they're at home, with your partner. Um, it's great if you can get outside. Again, anything that feels good to you take a walk outside in the sunshine or in the rain in Washington, uh, ride your bike, uh, go play tag with your kids outside. Anything that gets your body moving is a good thing. Um, the next two are really just strategies that are little pieces of mindfulness. I think we talk about mindfulness a lot. Um, and mindfulness is really simply disengaging from forward thinking, from thinking about what happened before or what's going to happen next and centering us ourselves in the now. So a very simple way to practice mindfulness is to do a breathing exercise. And so I want to actually ask you to engage in that with me right now. Um, so if you will indulge me, if you will close your eyes and let go of whatever you're thinking about doing next, let go about what you did earlier today and just feel yourself sit in your chair, feel the floor underneath your feet and we're gonna take a breath. We're gonna bring the breath up through one side of our body so it's gonna start up through our feet, up through our knees, into our chest, through our neck, across our forehead and then we're gonna exhale. We're gonna bring it down our chest, our knees, our feet. We're going to inhale and feel it come up, bringing in your energy across the top of your forehead and exhale and let go of things that don't serve you as you breathe out. So inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. So if you have a few minutes and you can do that, try doing that 10 times. It will slow your heart rate. It will give you that little mini break that sometimes you need to get through to the next thing. Um, the next one's also really simple, count to 10. Again, slowly, mindfully, put whatever got you there away and just think about counting the numbers and just focus on the numbers. And at the end, you will have, again, decreased your blood pressure just a little bit, your breathing will have slowed, and you might be a little bit more ready to move, move forward onto the next thing. Um, the next one is to try and maintain a positive attitude and practice gratitude. So that's kind of a two-parter. Um, the way that our brain works, without going deep into neurophysiology, uh, when we have a thought, it creates a pathway in our brain. So if we have a positive thought, it creates a pathway. And then every time we have another positive thought, it 
it goes along that same pathway. And so over time, the more you have that same kind of positive thought, the groove gets a little bit deeper. And so then it's easier to find that groove. So when you have a negative thought, the same thing happens. So you want to consciously try and think that positive thought to deepen that groove so it's easier to fall into it on an automatic basis, right? So if you're not thinking about it, then you tend to be a little bit more likely to fall into that deeper groove that involves the positive thought. So that's something that we can work on over time. Um, and practicing gratitude, that's a way of, of practicing those positive thoughts. You can do something very simple, again, with your morning cup of coffee. Maybe you, maybe you have a journal and maybe you write down one thing you're grateful for as you drink your morning coffee, right? For that very two minutes before the kids are up and the dog needs out and breakfast needs made and the telephone's ringing or the emails are dinging, whatever's going on, if you can just take that little moment and practice gratitude that starts to have frame things in a positive way and it might just make your day go a little tiny bit differently. Um, accept that you can't control everything and that's just about giving ourselves grace. We're doing the best we can. Um, and sometimes it's great, and then sometimes the outcome is not so great. But I think we just need to say, you know, acknowledge that we did the best we can and view ourselves with grace in the same sort of way we would view others with grace. Um, welcome humor. Laughing is good. Laughing is very good. Uh, again, one of those little assignments, if you're homeschooling your kids, give them homework to go get online and find the funniest joke they can and then have them tell it to you at the dinner table. Right? Anything that makes you laugh, it will make your kids laugh. Anything that makes your kids think you're funny is good. It just, it will just bring a little bit of joy and levity. So if you can, welcome any bit of humor you can until they. Um, get involved in your community. Even though, this is a good example of that, right? Even though COVID has made our lives different, there are still ways we can contribute and be involved. So look for those and join when you can. Um, Think about what triggers your stress and anxiety and come up with a strategy to manage those. Or at the very least, learn to recognize those and lean in and say, you know what, when I do this thing, I get anxious. And okay, I'm anxious, but you know what? It doesn't kill me, I get through it. And so I'm gonna feel this way and then I'm gonna not feel this way. So just sometimes acknowledging that makes it easier to get through. And then I think the final strategy is really to talk to someone. And we talk to all kinds of different people. It might be informal people in your life. It might be your partner. It might be your mom. It might be a religious person in your life. It might be your neighbor. Um, but talking can help. Uh, and then I think if none of these things are working and you are feeling overly stressed, you're feeling like you're not able to cope, you're not sleeping, there's a change in your eating, you're eating more, you're eating less, um, you have a marked increase in irritability, or you have thoughts of hurting yourself, that's time to move to the next level. So then you need to reach out and you need to in, reach out to more professional kinds of interventions. And so there's a there's all kinds of resources. We have a resource page that, that will come up for you at the end of the slide deck, I believe. Um, or we'll make sure Emily gets it out to people. And the other great place to start is your primary care physician. Your primary care physician can always get you connected with a great resource um, for therapy or other kinds of supports. And so with that, we are gonna move on and Nikki Jones is gonna talk to you. Hi guys, I'm eternally grateful for the coping skills delivered before public speaking. So thanks, Stacey. Um, with all the challenges we face during COVID, people are trying to manage and cope and find ways to feel good. For some people that can be alcohol or drugs and some of the ways people are finding to survive are working in the short term. And for roughly 90% of people, experimentation with substances will not transition into severe addiction. But I would like to speak towards how to recognize if you're, you or a loved one's coping skills are becoming something less likely to help before it becomes problematic. During this lockdown, shutdown pandemic, 
the use of substances has gone up. For some people, it has been an increase in their existing use. For others, it's been a relapse after a period of sobriety. And for a growing population, it is people who are beginning substance use for the first time. Like the type of people who use substances, the impact of substance use falls on a spectrum that can range from needing to use to get out of bed in the morning to noticing that you need to use more than usual to feel buzzed. And the question is, where do you fall on that continuum? There are multiple ways you can seek to find out if you potentially are developing an issue with substances and to access treatment if needed. There are screeners you can complete online at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. You can make an appointment with your physician who can complete a screening and referral to treatment if needed, or you can contact the Washington Recovery Helpline. Living in a tech age, there are also apps to monitor your use and give feedback into your behaviors. But the most common way is the 30-day challenge. Some people elect to go fully sober for one month. For others, if total abstinence is not the direction they would like to go, they can set a reasonable time limit based around their daily use. For example, if I drink one to two beers a night after work and three to four on weekends, I might set my limit at two beers a day for the next 30 days. If I find I can stick to my two a day limit, easy breezy, and I'm probably doing okay. But if I find that I cannot hold myself to my two a day limit and I start fudging on the numbers, finding reasons not to stick to the limit, I get to drink extra tonight because I had a rough day at work or it's my best friend's birthday party or even bargaining. I can have three beers tonight because I only drank one yesterday. I'm probably going to want to take a closer look at my use. It does not necessarily mean I'm addicted, but it can mean I'm heading for trouble. For people who have a history of substance use, the social isolation and change in face-to-face -face support meetings can be an acute challenge. A return to use after a period of sobriety can be particularly devastating for someone who has fought hard for their recovery, but it is not a failure. It means treatment needs to be started again, adjusted, or maybe a different type of treatment is needed. It is similar to someone with diabetes who needs to go back into their doctor to reevaluate their treatment plan. It is a matter of reapproaching those foundational skills that have already been redeveloped and knowing you are not alone. For individuals who might need to go into SUD treatment, help remains available during COVID. Agencies are offering services through telehealth, and people are able to attend over phone or video appointment if needed. Some are even returning to in-person appointments. Social distancing leaves people feeling more vulnerable because it interferes with natural support systems. For some people, the area of concern may not be substances, but other coping mechanisms, shopping, gambling, working, sex, video games, or social media. Whatever way you have found to function, to feel good during this time, we are all trying to do the best we can. It is important to go easy on yourself and others because the world we live in is challenging. Make sure you're grounded, sleeping, and eating right, and acknowledging it is okay to not be okay all of the time. Try to set realistic expectations for yourself and be gentle. This is particularly important for mothers, and I would like to pass it over to Mandy to talk about how to take care of yourself so you can be there for your children at this time. Hey there, everybody. My name is Mandy, and I just want to talk for a few minutes to those of you who are moms or who are planning on being, because we have a, an enormous amount of responsibility, especially when you have young young children. And I know it can get really overwhelming sometimes. Um, to be able to support our kids, we have to take care of ourselves, right? Um, and that can seem really impossible, but those little moments 
that um, we can be kind to ourselves are so important. And um, although things like hot baths and pedicures are really nice, the best way to take care of yourself in the long run is to focus on creating a life that gives you safety and peace and consistency. And when I was when I was thinking about this, I was thinking I remember as when my when my children were little thinking I don't even have time to poop. Like I, there's no way I'm going to create a life right now, right? It's it's hard. There's a lot going on. Um but little moment to moment decisions can can make huge differences. So there's a few important things that we've touched on a little bit. Um one of them is food. Eating well sets you up for success in a lot of ways. And planning is a is a huge thing planning for food. Um shopping the perimeter of the grocery store will really help you to choose better food than if you're going down the aisles. Um and if you focus on making your meals colorful, your kids are happy and you're getting a more well well-rounded diet that way. Um one thing that's really important as a mom, we often will put a plate in front of our kids and we don't eat. But you need to eat and and you need to you need to have fuel to keep going and and so eating when your kids eat is a really great way to to do that even if you're eating something you don't love. Um and then um Stacy talked a little bit about avoiding um caffeine and um, other substances but one that's also really important is tobacco. Um a lot a lot of people smoke and um because that initial nicotine rush causes a sense of calm we get this feeling that we need it for anxiety but studies have shown that smoking increases anxiety and stress overall. So it's it's a good thing to consider um if you are a smoker consider um consider stopping or at least cutting back. Another big thing that impacts our day-to-day -day lives is our relationships, right? Our romantic relationships. And um when you're when you're making decisions about a, a romantic relationship, it's so important to consider your personal, physical and emotional well-being first. If that partner or current partner is not supportive or the a potential partner or your current partner is not supportive of your parenting or is abusive in any way, you're not going to have the emotional energy to be the mom that you want to be to your kids. Um and so that's it's a it's a good way to look at making decisions about that. Is this is this person giving me emotional energy to be a parent? If they're not, it might not be the best situation for you. Another thing is finances. If you can seek out some budgeting tips and strive for consistency with your bills, um even if you don't have a whole lot, just having a plan for that can decrease your stress in a really big way. Another thing too is um taking care of yourself is a great way to model how your children can take care of themselves. So when you set boundaries with your kids to take care of yourself, like if you say mom's going to take 10 minutes out to read by herself and you can play with your toys during that time. You're teaching them that they can and should take care of themselves too and take time out when they need it. Helps them to regulate themselves, um which then makes parenting easier for you. So um I hope those have been a couple little helpful tips and um I'm really pulling for you guys as you work toward um making your lives a little bit calmer. I think we all we all need that right now. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mandy. Um I just wanted to loop back and let everybody know that one of the things that none of us mentioned and that I meant to mention was apps. There are so many good apps out there right now and we found one that we really like. It's called Fenvelo and in your gift bags there's going to be a code in there and it's a 3 month it's good for 3 months and so you can try out this app but this app is a uh, um it will help you manage your mood and emotional well-being using artificial intelligence so it learns you and it starts to guide you and it, it so it will become a personalized experience as you try it so i just want to encourage y'all to look in your gift bag and download that app and use the code so you can give it a shot thank you great thank you so much to jenna stacy Nikki and Mandy, this was a wealth of information. Um I just want to take a, a moment here to pause and let those of you who are tuned in know that there's a chat feature. If you have any questions for our panel, um please type them into the chat feature and we'll give it a second. Um let's see here. As we're waiting for those questions to pop up, I had a couple and I'm not sure which of you would like to um answer this, but I was thinking, I'm a brand new mom myself. What um 
you, you touched on it a little bit, and I'm wondering if there are some more tips and tools for those of us who think, ah, oh, I don't have time for myself. How do I carve out those little moments? I think, Mandy, you touched on it. Um, you know, you just have to take advantage of those little moments. I'm trying to think, what's an example of one? Um, I have a, a brand new baby, and the minute he wakes up, I forget about my own needs, and sometimes um, don't make time to shower when I want to shower or eat when I want to eat. Um, how do we remember to, what are some examples of those little moments we can carve out? I don't know if that would be right. Mandy or Stacy or who'd like to speak. I, I can speak on that just real quick. If anyone else wants to chime in, please do. Sorry, it's getting dark here, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting darker. Um, but, you know, the, the key, I think, is recognizing that you need it. And so little things like if you, ha it's harder when you don't have a partner, but when you have a partner, taking advantage of that as much as possible is going to help you. Um, it, even if it's, even if you have a deal with them about, hey, I've got, I'm going to have 15 minutes at this time of day that is just for me. And you are going to take this kiddo come hell or high water. So um, ha having plans like that are, can be really helpful. It also gives you something to look forward to during the day. Um, and also, especially when your kiddos are little, they can cry. It's okay to let your child cry for just a little while so that you can collect yourself. Um, it's, it's actually really important. Um, babies get hurt when, when women forget that, that it's okay for babies to cry. It's the only way they know how to communicate with us. So just know that you can, you can take a break. You can shut their door if they're in a crib safely and you can breathe for a few minutes. And, um, that's, it's, it's a good idea. It's safe. It's not, it's not a, it's not bad parenting. It's great parenting. Thank you, Mandy. Um, we have one more question I just saw come in, and this is for Stacy. We, um, I, that breathing exercise you gave us was super helpful. I'm wondering if you have another breathing exercise you'd be able to share with us um, here while we're live. I can try. Sure. <laughs> or, or are there other, other ways, um, other cues or triggers that we need to keep track of that to remind ourselves, oh, this is when breathing would, would help. I think sometimes in the hubbub and the busy, bustling nature of our lives, sometimes it's like, oh, wait, when I'm laying in bed, now I remember I was supposed to try that breathing exercise. When would there be, what are some little cues to think of or to remember of like, now is the time to take those 10 deep breaths and practice? Well, I think um, anytime you feel that fight or flight response, uh, the neurophysiology is your amygdala goes off, right? So anytime you get that fight or flight, that immediate fight, flight or freeze response, that's a really good time to try a breathing exercise. And so you don't have to close your eyes. Um, a very, very simple one without going into all the circular breathing is if you just try dry, diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. So if you breathe deep into, and expand your ribs and your belly and your diaphragm and try and keep your inhales and exhales equal, that too will have a calming effect on your physiology. And so that you can do just three or four deep breaths like that. The trick to that one is just make sure they're even. So you want to breathe in and out to the same cadence. Okay. Wow. All right. Thank you so much, Stacey. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all very, very much. This was incredibly helpful information. I know it applies to each and every one of us, especially as we're practicing social distancing and remaining at home by ourselves, either alone or with family members or with friends, whoever we're social distancing um, with um, in quarantine here. Um, I know that there are some tidbits and nuggets of information from each of your presentations. So thank you so much for being with us. All right, and I'd like to do one more thank you to our education sponsor, United Healthcare. Um, Stacy mentioned the San Bello app. And I just wanted to share a little bit more about that. United Healthcare would like to offer all 150 registered participants of our session tonight um, a three month premium access to the San Bello app, which is designed to support health through these challenging times. Based on cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness meditation, San Bello provides recommendations for activities designed to meet you where you're at. And so we will, in our follow-up email, we'll send out a link, not only to all of these slides, but we'll send out a link to the San Bello app premium three month um, subscription for you. So just wait for that email and you'll get that. So thank you, United. Next up, we have our very own Sarah Carasino who will be speaking about nutrition for diabetes prevention and management, another extremely important topic. 
Sarah graduated from Seattle Pacific University, earning a Bachelor of Science in Food and Nutrition Science. She completed her dietetic internship through the University of Washington. Sarah started her career at Grays Harbor Community Hospital and has 15 years of experience both in clinical and outpatient dietetic practice. Sarah has been with Summit Pacific since February of 2019. And I'd just like to remind you, if you have any questions for Sarah, go ahead and start typing them in the uh, chat feature. Um, you can go ahead and do them throughout the presentation and I'll be able to read them to her um, after the, the presentation. So thank you and welcome Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. Hello everyone. Um, thanks for attending. And tonight I'm gonna be talking about nutrition for diabetes um, prevention and management. So a little glimpse of what we'll cover today. The prevalence of diabetes in our country, risk factors for diabetes, nutrition and exercise recommendations, small steps that we can take to make healthy changes, and then some tips to stay healthy during the holidays that are coming up. So here are a few facts that I found from the CDC website. Um, for, so in our country, as you can see, more than 34 million people in the United States have diabetes, and one in five of them don't even know they have it. And also, 88 million adults in our country, so that's over a third of us, have prediabetes, and the majority of them don't know they have it either, about 84%. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in our country, and it might even be underreported. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 90 to 95% of all diagnosed cases of diabetes, whereas type one diabetes is about five to 10% of the diagnosed cases. Six to 9% of pregnant women will develop gestational diabetes, and that places them at higher risk for developing type two diabetes later in life. And in the last 20 years, the number of adults diagnosed with diabetes has almost doubled or maybe even more than doubled um, because our population overall has become increasingly overweight and obese. So I found a map of diabetes prevalence in our country. And I just want you to take note of the different shades of red that you see. Um, the lighter shades are found maybe Montana, Idaho, Colorado area. But the darker shades indicating greater than 12% of the population has been diagnosed with diabetes are mostly in the south. So Oklahoma, Louisiana, Alabama, right in there, we can see that diabetes is most prevalent in our country. So here's another map to compare with the obesity rate in our country. And what we can see with the last slide and this slide is that the areas that are most prevalent in both diabetes and obesity tend to be in the south of our country. So I think that's a big indicator. Um, what we know about the South is a lot of the food um, is fried and um, there's just a lot of uh, less healthy eating practices in that area in general. So here are some risk factors for diabetes. Um, for all three, type one, gestational, and type two, there's a strong link to if there's a family history. So genetics play a big role in whether a person is diagnosed with diabetes. Um, type one uh, can be just, you know, the pancreas doesn't make insulin anymore and it's auto antibodies damaging. So the damaging immune system cells happens. So the pancreas just doesn't make insulin anymore. Um, gestational diabetes, in addition to family history, um, age and the weight of the pregnant woman and um, ethnicity and race play a role. And for both gestational and type two, that race and ethnicity plays a role. It's found that in African-American, Hispanic, American Indian, and Asian American populations, there's a higher prevalence of both gestational and type two diabetes. With type two diabetes, weight, inactivity, age, um, if they've had gestational diabetes, if a woman has been diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome, if there's high blood pressure or high cholesterol, all of those are risk factors for type two diabetes. So the risks for having uncontrolled diabetes, so when your blood sugars stay up high and they're not managed, include cardiovascular related events. So people with diabetes are twice as likely to have a diagnosis of some kind of cardiac complication. And that's, again, remember if your diabetes is uncontrolled. 
Other things that can happen are eye damage, kidney damage, nerve damage, and gastrointestinal tract changes. So we might not digest our food as well as we used to. A big player in blood sugars and diabetes is inflammation. So carrying extra weight and not being very active are all associated with higher levels of stress hormones. And, or excuse me, inflammatory chemicals. Oh, and stress. <laughs> but some of these live in our fat cells. And so it's especially true with the abdominal fat that we um, can gain around our middles. Um, that creates kind of a consistent low-grade state of inflammation. And I just wanted to point out that this is a pretty common effect of menopause when estrogen levels drop. So that's important for um, all of us women as we age to know that that gain of abdominal fat um, could be housing some low-level inflammation. Chronic inflammation interferes with insulin's actions, so blood sugar levels can be higher. And then, in turn, high blood sugar contributes to inflammation that damages our blood vessels. So our blood vessels, instead of being nice and flexible, um, they're not able to relax as well, they become more narrow, and it's really a lot harder for the blood to travel through the blood vessels. And stress, like I said before, um, increases inflammatory chemicals in the body. So there's a whole bunch of things. It's kind of like a, a vicious cycle of things that can contribute to inflammation. Um, so processed food and drinks, um, this contributes mainly to inflammation. So if you think of chips, cookies, um, fast food, soda, candy, um, prepackaged, pre-prepared meals, often those times are super um, high risk for contributing to inflammation. And then the type of fat that we have in our diet, we know that saturated fat and trans fat both contribute to inflammation. Um, so saturated fat comes mostly from animal sources. So think of the marbling in your meat or the skin on your poultry. Um, and then trans fat is actually a healthy fat, like a vegetable oil, that's been modified in processing of foods to act like a saturated fat or stay solid when they're packaged, and that increases its shelf life. Smoking, alcohol, and drugs, of course, contribute to inflammation, a sedentary lifestyle, and stress, things that I mentioned before. All of those things are some things that we have control over in our lives to help decrease inflammation. So that leads me to the standard American diet, and the abbreviation spells out SAD. But um, really, it consists of a lot of the things I just mentioned, a lot of processed foods, a lot of red meat, um, refined grains, and added sugars, um, and high-fat dairy products. So again, fast food is a really common um, meal for a lot of the population in our country. 75% um, of us don't eat any fruit in a day. 90% of us don't eat the recommended amount of vegetables and 99% of us, in general, as a whole, don't eat the minimum whole grain recommendation. So I love this quote. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates, 32% of our calories comes from animal food, 57% from processed plant food, and only 11% from whole grains, beans, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. That means on a scale of 1 to 10, our American diet, standard American diet, is a 1 out of 10. Hence the word sad. <laughs> so my hope is that when we talk this evening, um, we can find opportunities for you to um, make small changes. So that leads me into let's make some changes. Um, changing some lifestyle habits. So for finding nutritious foods to incorporate in the day. Um, if you're not exercising, start exercising even a little bit. goes a long way. Stopping smoking, avoiding the drugs and excess alcohol sleeping and stress reduction. So I'm going to talk mostly about food and a little bit about exercise. The National Dietary Guidelines recommends for all people um, that a healthy eating pattern should include two to three servings of vegetables every day. The darker and brighter color the better, more nutrients in there. Two servings of fruit a day, six servings from the starches or grains group, and half of those servings should come from whole grain options. Um, three servings of dairy a day and preferably lower fat options. And about five and a half ounces of protein. So if you think about what that serving size would be, it would be just about two decks of cards worth of protein in a, in a day. 
but it's not only meat. It could be um, unsalted nuts, it could be seeds, it could be eggs, or it could be soy, like edamame or tofu. And then to use fats and oils sparingly. Um, a healthy eating pattern will limit foods that ha are high in saturated or trans fat, added sugars, sodium, and alcohol. So less than 10% of our calories should come from added sugar, and the American Heart Association recommends no more than nine teaspoons or 36 grams for men, and no more than six teaspoons or 25 grams for women. And think that's added sugar, so that's not naturally occurring sugar in our foods like fruit. Um, less than 10% of total calories from saturated fat, and if alcohol is consumed, keep it to the recommended amount for your gender. One serving for women and two servings for men. And then physical activity, which is one of my passions. I love exercise. So people in the age group of 18 to 64, the main recommendation is avoiding inactivity. And if you can get at least 150 minutes in a week um, of moderate intensity exercise, that'll be just perfect to manage your chronic complication risks. Um, if you want to do 75 minutes a week, you can increase the intensity of that exercise. Um, you can have more extensive health benefits, obviously, if you increase the amount of time you exercise. So instead of 30 minutes, you could go 60 minutes a day. Um, you can divide up these intervals throughout the day. So if you don't have a 30 minute chunk, you could do three sets of 10. Um, and that's still gonna give you the same health benefits. And then a big recommendation as well as including muscle strength training, so resistance training, um, two days a week to help build lean body mass. If you have kiddos, six to 17 years, the recommendation is 60 minutes of activity a day. That can be play, that can be sports, um, but also to incorporate um, strength exercise about three days a week. And then in the 65 and over age group, follow the same recommendations of the 18 to 64 year olds. But if that can't be met, just try to be as physically active as possible. Incorporation of balance exercises is very important as well to prevent falls and also doing some strength and resistance training to maintain your lean body mass and your bone health will be important. So exercise is also our body's signal that it needs to use up the sugar in our bloodstream. So huge benefits with exercise. It's like an all-in-one deal. If you just exercise, you can help your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugars. It can decrease your stress. It can improve your sleep. It can help with your weight because it improves our metabolism, which is how efficiently we use the energy we take in from food. So there's aerobic exercise. Think of the type that will increase your heart rate, walking, running, swimming, jump rope. <laughs> um, and there's anaerobic, which is going to be your strength and resistance training. So this strength training is important because it helps increase our basal metabolic rate. It increases our lean body mass, so our muscle mass. And when that is increased, lean body mass is insulin sensitive. So if we have more lean body mass, our sensitivity to insulin's job in our body increases. Insulin's job is to get the sugar out of the blood and plug into our cells to be used effectively. And lean body mass needs glucose from our meals. So as we increase our lean body mass, we're improving our blood sugar levels after we eat. So if anyone out there has diabetes and you're testing your blood sugars, two hours after a meal or in the middle of the day, if you incorporate those strength training methods and you increase your lean body mass, you'll see an improvement in your blood sugar levels after you eat. Um, another important note on exercise is if your blood sugar, if you're testing blood sugars and if it's less than 100 before you exercise, it might be an appropriate time to have a small snack. So a little bit of carbohydrate and you could possibly combine it with a little bit of protein but just enough to help make sure your blood sugars stay stable during exercise, because exercise does cause your blood sugars to come down. Um, if you're in the 100 to 250 range of your blood sugars, you're good to go. You can go ahead and exercise and um, test your blood sugars after you exercise to see what impact it has. And then if you're 300 or more before exercise, you might not want to do vigorous activity, um, but you can still move around gently and main thing is drink water and trying to get your blood sugars down to about 250 before you do more vigorous exercise. Okay, and I wanted to also mention that Summit Pacific has a program that is free 
called Summit Fit that is happening every Tuesday and Thursday in the months of November and December via Zoom. And it's aerobic and strength training combined. So it's for all ages and absolutely free. And we can absolutely send out more information about that if there's people interested. So let's take a look at how our body um, utilizes the carbohydrate that we take in. So this diagram shows us the groups of carbohydrate. We've got starches and starchy vegetables, fruit and fruit juice, milk and yogurt, and sweets and desserts. So as we eat these foods and the digestion process starts, our stomach breaks down these foods into glucose. And then glucose travels into our intestines and is then absorbed into our bloodstream. As we digest, the pancreas gets a signal to make insulin. So as blood sugars are rising from the food that we eat, insulin is being made and also released into the bloodstream. So insulin's job is to bind with the cell at specific places on the cell called receptor sites. I think of them as doors. And it unlocks that door so that sugar can leave the blood, glucose, can leave the blood and enter the cell to be used for the cell's meal or its fuel. So diabetes can occur, can occur when the pancreas either doesn't make as much insulin as it needs to or is as needed for the amount of blood sugar in the bloodstream, or when there's insulin resistance. And think of it as if someone changed the lock on that door without telling anyone about it. You might have plenty of insulin coming in, but it just can't get that door unlocked. So in both scenarios, sugar stays way too high in the blood and continues to circulate and can cause all those chronic complications we talked about earlier if it stays too high for too long. So let's talk about how we build a nutritious meal. Um, there's a couple of plate methods out there. There's one from choosemyplate.gov, which is the USDA website, and there's one from um, Diabetes Forecast. So both of them incorporate um, at least half of your plate from fruits and vegetables, but the one from Diabetes Forecast has you fill up your whole half side of your plate from non-starchy vegetables with fruit on the side. And then a quarter of your plate from a lean protein and a quarter of your plate from a starch or a starchy vegetable with room for one serving of a milk or a yogurt on the side as well. So when we're talking about meal planning and blood sugar management, consistency is really the key. Um, so having about the same amount of food at each meal, not skipping a meal during your day, having about the same amount of carbohydrate at your meal so your blood sugars don't take a roller coaster ride, um, filling your plate with whole foods and really avoiding those processed foods. If you have diabetes and test your blood sugars, your goals for blood sugars should be about 80 to 120 first thing in the morning before you eat or drink. And then in the middle of the day, if you test, the ultimate goal is to have them under 140 two hours after your meal. So let's talk a little bit about counting our carbohydrates because this is really common um, to talk about with people who are managing their diabetes um, with their diet and with medication too. But uh, consistency, like I said, is the key. So when we look at a typical starting place for, for what a meal might entail, I usually recommend starting with two to three carbohydrate choices. So that translates to about 30 to 45 grams of total carbohydrate. And then for any snack, keeping it between zero to two choices or zero to 30 grams of total carbohydrate. So the scale that I have on this slide will help us not have to do all the number crunching in the math work when we're looking at labels. So we can see that it's not cut and dry. Not everything is in 15 gram increments on the label. So we might have some that are like 43 grams of carbohydrate, total carbohydrate. So where does that fall? So this scale right here is very helpful to give us a range for how many grams of carbohydrate is how many carb choices. We can see on this slide also at the bottom, you are able to subtract the fiber grams from total carbohydrate because that's a part of the carbohydrate that does not change to sugar. Um, so we get a little bit more wiggle room if we have a higher fiber food. And then if there are any sugar alcohol grams, we can subtract half of those grams from the total carbohydrate number. So it gives us a little bit more wiggle room for our carb counting. So I have an example of what a nutrition facts label looks like and kind of the steps to take when you're doing your carb counting. So first, always, we want to look at the serving size that's being advertised on the label. This company for this product is saying that two thirds cup of whatever it is, is what they're calling a serving. So then we're going to go down and look for total carbohydrate. 
For this product, we see that that's 37 grams for the serving size of two-thirds cup. Next, we're going to look to see if there's any dietary fiber. Sure enough, we've got four grams in this product. So to calculate the total carbohydrate for carb counting, we're going to take 37 minus 4, which gives us 33. And looking at our scale that we just looked at, you can see the range goes from 37, which is two and a half choices, down to 33, which is in the two choice category. So that's an example of how fiber can give you a little bit more wiggle room um, with your food choices. So if you're in the ballpark of two to three carb choices, which this food is, that's a good starting place for a meal. But also take into account, hmm, that's only two thirds cup. Is that gonna be enough? <laughs> so that's how this helps. It helps you determine if this food is gonna fit into your meal plan. Let's talk a little bit more about fiber. It's the structural part of fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, grains, nuts and seeds. It's not broken down to sugar like we talked about earlier. Um, the goal intake for adults is between 20 to 35 grams a day. So if we get five, five servings a day from fruits and vegetables and we get at least three servings of whole grains, we're gonna be pretty close to that value. Um, it helps you feel full. It helps lower cholesterol. It helps slow our blood sugar levels rising, slow down how quickly they rise. And it also helps keep things moving through nice and consistently. Um, when you're increasing fiber, make sure you increase your water intake as well because that helps your body handle that increase in fiber. And if you have a kiddo, just add five to their age for their daily fiber um, suggestion. So some carbohydrate, carbohydrate counting tools that I've found include um, MyFitnessPal, MyNetDiary, Macros, or MyPlateCalorieTracker. Um, a lot of people are really um, savvy with their smartphones and find that those are really kind of their one-stop shop for all of their things, like their calendar, their alarms, everything. So if you're tracking things and you have everything in one place, a lot of times smartphone apps are the way to go. So here's some um, options for you to consider and look into. Um, there's also an app that focuses on not only food tracking, but also mindfulness behind eating and how you're making your food choices and what your thought process is and kind of addressing some of those habits. And that is Noom, but there is a fee to use that app. And then if you just want a website or a book, calorieking.com is a really good website to look up food and what their um, nutrition value is. Um, Calorie King also has a book that's available. I found it last at Walmart, but you can find it on Amazon too if you don't want to go shopping. But Calorie King is written by a fellow dietitian. I um, wanted to uh, touch on the Mediterranean diet because it incorporates a lot of the things we've been talking about. And it really focuses on the eating habits of the people who um, live next to the Mediterranean Sea. And it increased in popularity, or it was noticed most, uh, starting in the 1960s when they found that these people really were um, not dying as much from heart disease. And so they tried to look into what, what was their lifestyle like, what was different. So this heart healthy Mediterranean eating plan includes daily intake of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, all of those whole plant-based foods that we've talked about, daily exercise, a weekly intake of fish or chicken um, or beans and eggs and moderate portions of dairy products. So not as heavy on the dairy products as maybe some places here in our country are and limited intake of red meat. So when we took, when we look at a graphic of what that might look like, we see that really the, the, the whole plant-based foods and the exercise and the social interaction that comes with sharing food together are the foundation of this eating principle. And then we see that the fish and the seafood and the poultry and the dairy and the meat kind of are less and less um, recommended to be frequently in, um, in the diet plan. Um, it also recommends um, having a glass of wine. So the, um, again, the one serving for women or two if you're a man um, but really, again, exercise and those whole plant-based foods are the key to this eating plan. So let's talk a little bit more of that whole food plant-based diet. Um, it's, you know, there's really a lot of evidence-based recommendations out there that this, this meal plan, incorporating more plants in your diet, can help reverse cardiovascular disease. And if you remember that um, cardiovascular disease is a risk of having uncontrolled diabetes. 
So it can also help normalize our blood sugars. And it's pretty much the opposite of the standard American diet, not processed food, it's whole plant-based food. Um, nutritionfacts.org is a great website for a lot of resources. There's evidence-based research on there. Um, the founder breaks it down in simple to understand terms. A couple of tools that are uh, included on that website are the Stoplight Food Guide and um, also the daily, daily Dozen list that really helps you kind of include more vegetables, um, more fruit. How many servings a day are you getting from all of those types of plant foods, including exercise and water. So I have a graphic of the Stoplight Food Guide because I think that's a pretty simple um, graphic to kind of grasp what the recommendations are. So green light foods are going to be any of those unprocessed plant foods that we talked about. Um, these are going to be more protective for our cardiovascular system and just provide all the nutrition that our body is really needing. The yellow light foods are going to be processed plant foods and unprocessed animal foods. So the example that shows up there are bread, which is a processed plant food, and steak, which is a whole animal food. Other examples would be chicken breast or turkey or maybe tortilla. So those are going to be yellow light food examples. And then the red light food is going to be all those really highly processed foods like the soda, the chips, the cookies, the, the um, hot dogs, uh, processed meat like lunch meat, bacon and sausage. And so I love this description. Ideally, these foods should be avoided just like running a red light in the real world. You might be able to get away with it sometimes but you wouldn't want to make it a regular habit. <laughs> so I think that's a good kind of summary of how those foods um, should be incorporated, just very sparingly and not very often. So I wanted to give, offer some healthy snack ideas. Um, I really love, you know, combining a couple different food groups together for a snack and not just having one. So when we think about whole grains, fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, nuts um, for healthy fat, um, lean protein, how can we kind of mix all these up together? So this, again, reminder, it's especially helpful before exercise or if it's going to be longer than four to five hours between meals for managing our blood sugars. And another reminder, if your blood sugar is less than 100 before you exercise, have a little bit of carbohydrate, maybe about 15 to 30 grams, which is one to two choices, and you could combine it with a little bit of protein just to make sure your blood sugar stays stable for your exercise. So there's a big list here. Um, some of my favorites are going to be down towards the bottom on the left-hand side, a banana or apple or celery with peanut butter. That's one of my favorite snacks. Um, I also love the idea of combining cucumber slices with a whole grain cracker or um, some light switch Swiss cheese. Um, you know, there's just a lot of combinations on here. Chips and salsas on here. So that's an a, a example of um, whole grain chip would be a yellow light food with fresh salsa, which would be more green light food, especially if you make it yourself at home. So um, salad topped with grilled chicken, um, a hard boiled egg, um, vegetables with hummus, which is another one of my favorites. So there's a lot of options and ways that you can vary up and get your plants in during the day by having some healthy snack ideas. And then just a touch on the holidays coming up. We all have our favorite foods around this time of year. I know I do. And um, when we think about managing blood sugars through that, where food is such a big focus, um, I just really recommend trying to stay as much on track with your usual routine as possible. So if you're having you know, that set amount of carbohydrate each meal, continue with that routine, keep it stable. Eat regularly, maintain that usual routine. Um, stay hydrated, lots of water. That helps bring your blood sugars down if you have a sweet treat especially. Um, and be aware of hidden sugar in some of those holiday beverages. Um, if you're going to a gathering, uh, bring your own food, bring your own uh, dish that you know is kind of a safe dish for you to choose from um, while you're there so you don't have to come and realize that every single thing there is maybe a really sweet treat and you can't really take very much of it unless you want your blood sugars to skyrocket. Um, tweaking your favorite recipes for a healthier version is an option, um, paying attention to, your, to when you feel hungry and when you feel full, and trusting those cues. When your body says it's had enough, you can say, okay, I've had enough, and if I, if I have some more food that I want, I'll save it for another time. Um, so that's really important when we're managing blood sugars as well. Um, the 80-20 rule, 
So 80% of the time having those really good, nutritious, whole foods that aren't highly processed. And then 20% of the time having some of those special foods. So it's really, there's room, there's wiggle room. There's always wiggle room, but the goal is to not make the highly processed, highly sweet foods the norm. Um, choose one or two must-have treats. So if you're at a buffet table and you kind of eyeball the spread, choose one or two of the things that you think you want to eat the most and have a small portion of them. And the rest of the foods, just try to stick with the whole plant-based foods and maintain your carbohydrate count. Um, socializing away from the food table. A lot of times having something in our hand that is us participating in the food and beverage intake is important. So um, if you've had your kind of designated amount of carbohydrate um, already from your favorite one or two choices, then a really nice thing to be able to do is just hold a beverage in your hand. So you might be able to bring one of your own that is sugar-free, for example, Bubbly or LaCroix or one of those um, sugar-free flavored seltzer waters, um, or just water with a little lemon slice in there as a refresher. So having something that looks like you're partaking of the food and beverage is, is nice, and it keeps your hands occupied too. Um, and then take the focus off the food. Find other activities to do to make memories. So puzzles, games, um, charades, uh, scavenger hunts, um, a white elephant gift exchange, um, some crafts. So those are all things that you can do as a family um, to kind of be occupied and um, take that focus really away from so much on the food. A lot of people think of gathering around the food table, which is definitely a wonderful experience, but we can take some of that gathering away from the food table too. Or sports in the yard, football in the yard, something like that. <laughs> Have fun with it, find your own activities. So to kind of wrap it up and put it all together, um, here's a few tips that kind of summarize um, the recommendations and the conversation we've had. Um, keeping carbohydrates consistent at each meal. Find out how much works best for you. Oftentimes that means you'll be testing your blood sugar at different times of the day if you do have diabetes to find out what carbohydrate content really works for your blood sugar management. Um, choose some meals that could easily transition to a green light meal. So if you have for example, beef stew. You could transition that to being, okay, lots of vegetables and beans for a little bit of protein instead of the beef. Um, you can find new green light recipes a lot of places. Um, if you don't have access to internet um, or know someone who doesn't have access to internet that is really looking for some ideas, the library can be a good place if we can get in there. <laughs> um, and then Google and Pinterest, um, just use the search line whole food plant-based and you will find a lot of recipes that pop up. One of my favorite things to do is if I have a food that needs to be used up at home, I can pull up Pinterest and put those one or two food items in and whole food plant-based and see what pops up and what I can make just on the fly um, or what I can make if I make a, a scheduled stop to the grocery store and know what I'm getting. <laughs> but I get a lot of ideas from Pinterest that way using that um, whole food plant-based search line. Find and commit to doing enjoyable exercise and especially incorporating that lean body mass building exercise of strength and resistance training a couple times a week. And then making a plan to stay on track and sticking with it throughout the holidays is going to be super important to managing your blood sugars successfully. All right, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And I love this picture of vegetables and they're smiling and happy because that's how we feel when we eat them. <laughs>
don't have that exercise base. And so I usually start by asking them, what do you think sounds doable for you? Do you have an exercise or activity that you enjoy? Do you enjoy walking? Um, if you don't walk or can't walk, or if you have pain when you do movements, can we do chair exercises or stretching exercises? Something to get those big muscles in your body, the building that you're going in, to get some extra steps, um, taking the stairs during the day instead of the elevator. All of those little things will add up to more movement, and you can kind of get a baseline of, okay, you know, I know I need to start exercising, so okay, I know I can start walking, so let's see how far I can go. Maybe I'll just start with around the block and see how I feel. And then if you feel great and think you can do another one, then do it. But if that's enough, say, okay, so I know that my limit is one time around the block. So I'm gonna do that every day or three times a week, and I'm gonna slowly build up from there. So you definitely should start from where you're at. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So you're saying that those little things do count? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay, good. And I also heard you mention um, Summit Fit. Would you mind um, re refreshing our memory on what exactly Summit Fit is? Because this is so exciting. Yes, so um, Cindy back here at Summit Pacific is um, kind of spearheading this project and she is going to be offering a Zoom class for um, both aerobic and uh, so cardiovascular and strength training combined. And it's really for any age and any level. Okay. Um, I've seen her teach classes before and oftentimes it incorporates a chair. Um, so you can sit and do a lot of these exercises as well if you're not able to stand. It's not a lot of jumping around, um, but you know, it's modified. She'll give options for modifying it based on your um, activity level. So it's going to be starting in November, every Tuesday and Thursday. It'll be live on Zoom from 12.30 to 1.30, and unfortunately I don't have that link with me, but we can send that link out to everybody who participates um, if they're interested. And um, 1, 12.30 to 1.30, I think. It's just for the months of November and December. So a great way to kind of get introduced to exercise and see if that fits for you if you haven't done any exercise and really want to keep your blood sugars and your health um, on course through the holidays. Perfect. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I You're really welcome. appreciate that. Yeah, thank Summit you. Fit, everybody. We want to make sure you tune into that. And I did hear, not only is it free, but those are going to be recorded. So if you're not free, or available rather, from 1230 to 130, um, you can tune in and exercise at whatever hour of the day works for you. Yes, that's a good point. Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Let's see. Oh, we've got lots of questions here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yep, someone says, will this be recorded? Yes, it will. Um, let me see. Oh, and one more question here. Back to our conversation about diabetes. Um, okay, if someone is borderline diabetic or had just been prescribed insulin, can diet and nutrition eliminate or reduce the need to use insulin? Yes, that can is reverse a, it. I guess is what we're asking. Yeah, so that is a possibility. Um, there are some there are some people who, when initially diagnosed with diabetes, um, have to take medication because their blood sugars have been so high for so long. So the goal there is definitely to do whatever we can to get your blood sugars down into normal range. But with, um, with lifestyle changes and habit changes, especially regarding nutrition and exercise, if those need to happen and they hadn't yet, when people start incorporating those things, um, they definitely can see either their need for medications decrease or maybe sometimes they can get off medications altogether. It's not a guarantee, but it definitely is a possibility that um, incorporating some changes that we talked about, you know, making sure you're consistent with your intake, more plant foods can definitely help decrease your need for medication and maybe not have to take it. Great. Awesome. You're giving us hope, Sarah. Yes, That's there's awesome. hope. There's hope. Good, good. Well, let's see. It looks like I think that those are our questions. So thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have more pouring in. Um, as a reminder, these slides will be available on our website, and we're also going to send them out in the link um, with our follow-up email. So you will have access to all of Sarah's very valuable slides. So thank you so much, Sarah. We thank appreciate you. you. Okay, next I'm going to take a quick break and thank two of our sponsors, our corporate sponsors. We have Elma Health Mart Pharmacy with three locations here in downtown Elma, McCleary, and also East County Pharmacy. And this is attached to our wellness center here at Summit Pacific. So three locations to get your pharmacological needs. Um, thank you so much, Health Mart Pharmacy, for your longstanding support of Ladies' Night Out. We also want to thank Martin Bruni Liquor, who donated the wine and the gift baskets for our registered attendees. Um, Martin Bruni has been a longtime supporter of both Ladies' Night and a lot of our signature events, and also is the donor 
of our first auction, or excuse me, raffle item, we have a large basket I can't lift. <laughs> it has four bottles of wine. So Sarah mentioned one glass of wine a night is appropriate. So you'll have your stash there. Um, there are two stem glasses and a nice festive basket. So let's see who our first winner is. Okay, we've got a great little thingy thing here. So the Martin Bruni liquor um, wine basket. Our winner is Cheryl Barton of Aberdeen. Cheryl, we will contact you to figure out how to get this to you. So thank you so much for tuning in. And again, that was Cheryl Barton of Aberdeen, won our first raffle item. Okay, man, I could spin that thing all night. But we have a lot more to learn. So next up, we have our own Dr. Nicole Taylor who's going to be speaking about habit forming. How do you create good habits and stick with them? Gosh, I need to know. Dr. Taylor attended the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona, and has been providing care for over 10 years. She provides family medicine with a focus in women's health from adolescence through and beyond menopause. She has extensive knowledge and experience in hormone replacement therapy, weight management, and aesthetics. Dr. Taylor's practice in Arizona was awarded the most outstanding health organization from the Tucson local media. That's amazing. So again, we have our chat feature to enter your questions for Dr. Taylor as she's speaking. If you think of them, go ahead and enter those. We'll ask them to her um, after the presentation. So thank you, Dr. Taylor. Welcome. Hello, everyone out there in cyber world. I'm so happy to be here again. This is my third, I think, annual ladies' night out to speak at. And maybe some of you are disappointed that I'm not talking about hormones tonight, um, but maybe next year. This year I was inspired to speak about habits. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is day in and day out, I'm always concerned about um, how do I help people change their habits? How do I help people uh, convert their bad habits to good habits? Our daily lives are based on habits. Everything that you can think of is a habit. We get up, we wash our hair a certain way, we brush our teeth, we get into our car. Um, but why is it so difficult to create healthy, good habits and stick with them? So through COVID, so be between just seeing all of you, maybe some of my patients out there, and wanting to really help figure out how can we create better habits, and also because of COVID, that seems to have escalated into the negative direction. So it really inspired me. I actually read a book, listened to it, audio book, uh, called Atomic Habits. So this talk, I'm not an expert. <laughs> it's a book that I recently read um, that inspired me to want to share the information with you. I have no financial affiliation or personal affiliation with the book or the author. I'm just gonna help transfer the wonderful, fun information that I found. Whoops, a little too quick. Okay, so habits in general, good versus bad. So really, habits are not necessarily good or bad. They're either effective or they're ineffective. So they, they serve us in some way. There's a reason why we do them. And so whether they're a good or a bad habit, how do we distinguish maybe what is a beneficial or non-beneficial or effective or not uh, ineffective habit? Um, typically depends on the long-term benefits, right? Because we're doing them to feel good in the moment. And that, whether it's good or bad, okay? Um, how we determine whether it's good or bad is looking long-term, how will this affect me in one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, okay? Uh, an easy way that you could assess your own habits is think about your day, write down all the habits you could think of that you do, and then what you think is a positive habit, put a plus next to. What you think is a negative habit or a bad habit, put a negative minus sign next to. No judgment, just being able to, for you to visualize what you're doing on a daily basis. Generally speaking, again, good habits have net positive outcomes 
in the long run, and bad habits have negative outcomes. There are four stages of a habit. We have the cue, we have the craving, the response, and the reward. And this loop is constantly happening all day, every day, as you go through your day. And obviously, you're not aware of this, okay? So it's scanning, you're scanning your environment, you're predicting what will happen next, you're trying out different responses, and then you're learning from the results. So basically, you have a cue, there's a trigger, which is a craving, uh, which motivates you to respond, which provides the reward, satisfies the craving, and then reinforces you to want to do that again. We're going to focus on these four laws of behavior chains, and, and then hopefully, you know, at the end, we'll wrap things up, and I'll kind of focus on what our goals are for today and what I want you to take home, hopefully. And I'm sure your minds and juices and brain cells are kind of already thinking about and being critical of ourselves about all the bad habits that you have. But I'm going to hopefully change your mind by the end. So the four laws of behavior change are when you're wanting to change a behavior, it should be obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. So let's start with the first one. How do we make our habit that we want to do obvious? So the most common cue is time and location. There's something you can do that's called an implementation intention where you actually write this down or think about it in your head. It's your mantra, your new mantra. I will, you fill in the blank, at the specific time, at the specific location. Now, let me say this now and then I'm going to reinforce this at the end. Okay, this is not just about what you're eating, if you're exercising, you shouldn't be smoking. Okay, this could be anything. So as you can see, I will meditate for one minute at 7 a.m. in my kitchen. I will walk for 10 minutes at 5 o'clock around my neighborhood. I will drink a glass of water every morning when I walk into my kitchen. So the things that you want to do, your habits that you want to create, this is completely personal. No one, not even your provider, <laughs> even me, I try and help right, guide you in the right direction, but not even your provider can decide for you what is that habit that you want to gain, okay? Consider also habit stacking. So after a current habit that you do, you're going to add this new habit that you want to achieve. So after I turn on the shower, I'm going to do five push-ups, right? That takes what? less than a minute. After I lay down in bed for at night to go to sleep, I'm going to think of one positive thing that happened to me that day. So obviously you're going to create these based off your life, your daily in and out activities, things that are potentially getting you down. So if you're a negative type person, you're always thinking of, you know, the, the Debbie Downer. <laughs> You know, the Debbie Downer thinks like, oh, my life, I see what I did, I didn't, I didn't do that. You are someone who may need to think about more positive things. So this would might be your habit that you want to create to do. After I get in my car, I will take three deep breaths, especially if maybe getting in your car is attached to driving to work, which is a very stressful situation, okay? When I see my water bottle is half empty, I will fill it up. So that would be maybe specific for the person who says, you know, I really need to be drinking more water. How am I going to make this an obvious thing for me to change and do? Make it attractive. How can we make it attractive? So habits are specifically dopamine driven, which is a hormone in your brain that goes up when you get that happy, good response. Okay. This is what drugs specifically do to the brain. This is a direct response. So no one, grows up as a child and says, one day I would want, I want to be a heroin addict, right? Okay. There's some underlying issue. We're going to talk about that. They do the act. There's a cue. They do it. Dopamine rises and goes up in the brain. This is an actual chemical reaction that happens and you feel really good. 
What happens after that is the reward of feeling good, and I want to do that again. Okay, this happens with every habit. It's not just drugs. Um, the anticipation of the reward, the craving, is actually the thing that will give us the greatest dopamine spike. So after a while, when you do it, right, you're just back to kind of like, oh, well, you know, I just sat on the couch and watched my, binge watched my Netflix show, you know, but I'm still stressed out. So I'm going to look forward to that tomorrow night where I get to sit down and watch, binge watch again. I want you to think about potentially when you're trying to make things attractive is pair it with something um, that you already have to do. So if you're going to work and you drive there and you want to drink more water, maybe the night before you put your water bottle in the car ready for you to make it easy so that when you automatically get into the car, you can actually just be like, oh, okay, I need to drink my water. It's easy, okay? Um, environmental factors are huge when it comes to this. So the culture that we live in determines which behaviors are attractive. Um, we have a strong desire to fit in and to belong to the tribe. Isn't that true? Um, and the most important people are the close, the many, and the powerful. So the close are the people around you, your immediate family, your friends. The many are your tribe. So that might be your community. And then the powerful are famous people, people you look up to. Okay? Those people drive us to... They make it very attractive to make a habit happen. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is join a culture where one, your desired behavior is the normal behavior of that culture. Okay, I know that this is all easier said than done. Second, you already have something in common with that group. Okay, so an example would be maybe you are a reader and you, you like reading um, you strive maybe to find a group of women, okay, so there's a likeness there, same sex, uh, that are within the same age group, and they love to read, so a book club, okay, that, having that tribe, that culture is going to allow you to do the action that you want to do more of, because maybe you're wanting to read more. The normal behavior of the tribe typically overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. So we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right with ourselves. Isn't that true for both good or bad habits? So really think about that. Think about the people who surround your life, who you live with, who your friends are, who you choose to hang out with. Okay. I know this is very, that can be very deep at this point, but I just want to get those brain juices flowing. If a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find that attractive. And sometimes this can come from within. So it doesn't mean, I mean, it might be your own approval, you know? <laughs> we might do an action and you just have that feeling of, oh, like I feel really good that I actually accomplished that and did that. That makes it attractive enough for you to want to do it again. So this is a big one, making it easy, okay? So a lot of us, you know, we have a lot of goals. We want to get to the gym, okay? We want to get there at 5 o'clock in the morning. Is that realistic for you to do? If it's not, it's not the habit that you need to be working on creating, okay? You want to create an environment where doing the right thing is as absolutely easy as possible, okay? Reduce the friction. Um, when friction is low, habits are really easy. Prime your environment to make the future actions easier. So one example of this is that let's say you play guitar, okay, and it's been years and you keep on thinking and saying, you know, I really would like to get back into playing my guitar, but the guitar is in the garage, in its case, out of sight. One action you can do to make that easier for you, go get it out, set it up, and make it visual for you in your environment likely you're going to make that habit happen, okay? Also, let's say you feel like, you know what, I watch way too much TV, way too much Netflix. What could I be doing instead of doing that? I probably could be doing maybe some stretching or some exercise or food prepping, right? Take that remote, 
from your TV and go put it away in a different room. Go put it in a drawer. If it's out of sight, you are less likely to actually watch TV and pick up that remote. Okay. There is a two minute rule. So this is going to shock a lot of, a lot of, excuse me. When you start a new habit, it should take less than two minutes. Well, how can you exercise for two minutes, right? Has anyone ever told you just exercise for two minutes a day? That's all you need. This is where we go wrong. Okay. Many people have the mantra of go big or go, go big or go home, right? <laughs> I'm getting started COVID I'm home all the time. Now I'm going to start meal prepping. I'm going to start exercising 30 minutes a day. Okay. Is that really realistic? Are you likely going to do that? That does not sound easy to me. I can't do that. So what would be a step that you could take towards that ritual that is less than two minutes? Okay. What would that be? So, you know, you need to drink more water. How can you make that easy for you? Do you need to fill up water bottles and put them throughout your house where you walk into rooms every day? Um, if you're working out in the morning and let's say, or you want to work out, let's say every morning you wake up and you're thinking, okay, I, I have time. I can go outside for a walk. Is it maybe taking your shoes out, putting them by the front door with your socks so that you can get up They're right there. You see them and you put them on that takes less than two minutes. So that's where I want you guys thinking less than two minutes. What can I do to just get, get the juices flowing? Okay. Wet your whistle. My dad would be proud of me that I said that. Um, the more you ritualize the beginning of a process, the more likely that you will slip into the state of deep focus. Okay. And move on from that point forward. People want to feel good. We want to feel good. If you do something that feels good and that you're happy about and proud about, you will highly likely do that again. Okay. And what I would want you to do is focus on taking action, not being in the motion, not thinking of yourself actually out there walking you know, in your neighborhood, but the action of, I'm going to get up, I'm going to put my socks on and put my shoes on I'm going to tie them up and I'm going to start walking out the door. Okay. The amount of time you've been performing a habit is not important as the number of times. So you remember that rule that says it takes 30 days to create a habit. That's actually wrong. <laughs> it depends on how many times in that 30 days have you done that habit? So if you've done that habit four times, you're highly unlikely to stick with it. If you've done the habit 20 times or 30 times, you're going to way more likely be able to stick to that habit. And the last thing is satisfying. Again, we want to feel good, right? We're not going to do something if we feel horrible afterwards. So we're more likely to repeat a behavior if the experience was satisfying. And there's a rule, right? What we immediately are rewarded, we're going to repeat. If we're actually punished, we're likely not going to do that action again. So to get it to stick, we need to feel immediately successful. And we need to figure out, you all need to figure out what is that? Is it someone holding you accountable that says, pat on the back, great job, Sandy. I'm so proud of you. You did that. Awesome. Some people keep habit trackers. Okay. So the recent, you know, I, I would say more recent, it's not really that recent, but the Peloton bike. Okay. This is like this amazing phenomenon where you're home, you have a bike, you're watching, you're doing your thing. But if you have friends that are actually also have the Peloton bike, they can follow you. They can watch <laughs> everything you're doing every goal you've met, every exercise that you've had for some people that works really well. Okay. They really like that feeling. Um, some people will actually track on their calendar. I did this behavior check. I did this behavior another day check. Okay. Keep the streak alive. The other part of this is never miss twice. So if you miss a habit, we're human, right? We need to expect to make mistakes. Okay. Um, it's, it's normal to do that. So if that happens and you fall off your, your streak only one time, and then after that you get right back on. So for a few key points when choosing, um, cause this is very, like I said, individualized when choosing, what is that habit that you really feel you need to adjust or change? 
It needs to be something that is somewhat challenging for you, but not over the top because you will lose interest. Okay. So maximum motivation occurs when you're facing a challenge, just able to manage the difficulty of it. Okay. So the optimal level of arousal is the midpoint between boredom and anxiety, right? You don't want to be bored, but you don't want some, the habit to actually stress you out. This graph, it might be difficult for you guys to see, and I'm sorry, but this shows um, how if you even got better 1% per day, okay, 1%, that is, that's not huge, that in a year you actually will end up with, with uh, results that are 37 times better than if you did nothing, okay? So again, we get really hard on ourselves when we don't make drastic changes and huge leaps and bounds. And, and, then, and then, you know, it's the self-sabotage behavior. Well, I'll, I didn't do it anyway, so why, why continue? Every day, 1% better. I want to focus on how to break a bad habit. So we really can't break bad habits, okay? They're always going to be there. They're in our, in our cells. We, you will always remember, right? If you were a smoker, and even if it's been 20 or 30 years, if you smell a cigarette, that's going to turn on those receptors, and you are going to have that cue and that craving, okay? What I'd rather you think about is how can I replace that habit because we know for sure no one can argue the fact that bad habits interrupt our life they prevent us from accomplishing our goals okay I'd, I'd be really interesting if anyone could think of a bad habit that does not do that they jeopardize our health hands down physically mentally emotionally okay and they waste our time they do they do waste time um, why do we do them <laughs> and what can we do about it so this is the big question this is the, the, the issue Basically, it's stress and boredom, okay? So you could probably say after this, in parentheses, COVID. <laughs> so here's where you go deeper, okay? It's stress and boredom. Those are the surface of what's going on. This is where you really need to delve into your own being and figure out what is the thing that's stressing me out? Why am I bored? Okay, what is the issue? Because it's not just about being stressed and bored. It's about what is the irritating factor that's stressing me out, okay? And the goal would be to replace it. Replace, not eliminate, okay? Choose a substitute for your bad habit. And again, this is personalized. What is it that you want to change and what could you do instead? Cut out as many triggers as possible. So right now, if, you're, if you have a lot of bad habits, or one or two, you, your environment is created to support that, okay? Um, and I could give a thousand examples about this, but food in the cupboard that are things that you shouldn't be eating, um, maybe the cigarette pack laying out on the counter, um, you know, Netflix, every, every option of watching whatever you want to watch on TV. There's so many different things that are our triggers, right? Um, sometimes a trigger is just the act of driving home. So people will already, because their habit is, okay, I'm driving home. I'm going to decompress. When I get home, I'm going to have that glass of wine. That turns into maybe two or three. I'm watching my favorite Netflix show. I didn't prepare a great dinner for myself to enjoy. You see how that happens? It's, it's, way, it's happening way back before you even are even conscious that you're doing that. Um, so try to change your environment. If you change your environment, you will, I guarantee you, change your outcome. Join forces with somebody else. Okay, that might be your spouse, that might be your child, that might be a friend. Um, surround yourself with people who live the way that you want to live. And I know that, again, easier said than done, okay? But things to start thinking about. Um, and visualize yourself succeeding. We are so good at getting down on ourselves when we have not achieved what we think. We, we get caught up in the thought. You know, we get caught up in that uh, mindset and, and making us, ourselves feel bad about ourselves. But, so I want you to visualize yourself actually succeeding. 
And then this is a big one, using but to overcome negative self-talk. So, you know, um, we, we think and we focus about what we haven't done. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, you know, I ate that big, cheese, big piece of uh, chocolate cake, but tomorrow is a new day and I'm going to strive to be better, okay? Uh, plan for failure, like I said before. Remember that mantra, never miss twice. It's going to happen, it's natural. It happens to everyone with all the, the people that you might look at and think, wow, they got it all together, they eat great, they exercise, they're in shape, they're feeling great, they're happy. Those people fail as well. And so the big final take home here is where do you go from here? It's a lot, it's heavy, it's big. We all have lots of habits that we wish we can change. And again, the most challenging thing that I deal with every day with my patients, how can I help stimulate you? And the first step is to just to be aware, okay? That's the first step, be aware, look at your day, look at your habits and just have awareness of what you're doing or what you're not doing, okay? It's very easy to get caught up in how you feel about your bad habits. That is not useful. That doesn't move you forward. These thoughts take you away from what's actually happening. So what I want you to do is start focusing on when does your bad habit actually happen? How many times do you do it every day? Where are you? Who are you with? and what triggers the behavior and causes it to start. This is the book that I actually listened to, so I, that you can download it Audible. I think it's awesome. It's wonderful. The guy's James Clear, his story is great. Um, and if you can and you have uh, access to do so, I would highly encourage that. And uh, that's all I have to say for tonight. So. Thank you all for tuning in. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. I think having ineffective versus effective habits is something that all of us really struggle with. And um, I, took, I took a million notes just now, so this is awesome, and I'll definitely look up that book. Um, while we wait for people to enter their questions in the chat feature, I just wanted to go back to one um, topic you mentioned towards the beginning of your talk, and that was habit stacking. So, um, for example, I, you also mentioned the idea of meal prepping, and that is something I would love to master, and I'm <laughs> constantly failing at meal prepping, and my vision now is I love on a Sunday night or Sunday afternoon to prep my meals for the week. I have a new baby, and my husband travels for work, and so I love to be able to prep those meals for all three of us, or <laughs> for my husband and I, so that we're paying attention to the baby. Um, but I don't know how to start. So how would habit stacking, like what's an example of habit stacking to help myself start meal prep? Okay, so one thing I can do is I'll just use me, my, my life, okay? Something that I do that seems to work for me is that when I am already creating or cooking meals for my family and I have excess veggies available, I will go ahead and just extend that prep time for that meal that evening and make, and it might just be even one day, okay? So it might just be every night at dinner, if I'm chopping vegetables up and making a stir fry or making a salad, I will automatically make double and create those salads for the next day. Oh, okay. Okay, that's one, that's one way to do it because you, you know you have to eat. And again, this is personalized, right? So we're just using food as an example. Um, we cook pretty much every night. Um, every night typically is some sort of veggie, you know, whether it's a raw, like in salad or cooked and sauteed. And I will try and either, either just cook double automatically so that I know already we have lunch set for the next day or I will um, chop extra salads and so that the next day again they're all made and all we have to do is actually put our dressings on them. Smart. Oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to start doing that. Just buy extra of what you're making that night extra, so that you yeah. can prepare for the future. That's a great idea. Well, let's see. Um, looks like we've got a few questions here. Um, someone says, well, what about motivation? That's my hardest part. 
I know I have to, I should, but tomorrow sounds better and then I procrastinate. Any ideas? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Great question. They're hard questions uh, because like I said, I'm not the expert, but I would want you to go within and figure out why don't you have the motivation? What is keeping you back? There's something you're telling yourself. There's something deeper that's happening that doesn't allow you to take that first step. And maybe, maybe your goals are too big. Maybe you're striving too hard. So like I said, I want you to have, you know, goals and visions about being successful. Okay. Uh, whether, whatever that is fit, feeling better, better energy, better sleep. Okay. Maybe your goal, the task is too overwhelming and that's why you don't have the motivation. So what could be small, one small step that would take you closer to that goal that takes less than two minutes to do? Great point. Cool. Thank you. Um, let's see, one more question. How do you deal with not seeing improvement? That's a really good one. I would think with those small steps, sometimes we think, have I made any progress? So what do you, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Great question also from the audience. <laughs> so you wanna keep in mind that getting better 1% every day, you're not going to see initially huge improvements. Okay. So one, one thing may be bringing down your expectations. Okay. So we have a lot of expectations usually put on ourselves and we also compare ourselves with other people. What you need to think about is your genetics. Okay. And what you are actually able to achieve and make it realistic because if you're not seeing results, it's likely not the best. You're not going about it the best way that fits you, your, your being, your personality, and your genetics. Makes total sense. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, we really appreciate having you here at Summit Pacific. Thank you. And appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Well, next up, I'd like to thank our gift bag sponsor. So those of you who registered online, um, we had almost all of you come pick them up in person here at Summit. Uh, let us know via email if you didn't have time to pick them up. These are for our, the folks who, the 150 people who registered in advance for this seminar. Um, Radia Imaging, thank you so much for being our gift bag sponsor. Radia Imaging is patient-centered imaging and technology solutions. We appreciate you guys. And our fourth speaker tonight is our very own Dr. Mimi Syed. She'll be presenting on pregnancy and supporting the immune system during a pandemic. Dr. Syed is Summit Pacific's Emergency Department and Trauma Medical Director. She has been with Summit Pacific for three and a half years, over three and a half years. Dr. Syed is also Clinical Assistant Professor at Washington State University School of Medicine and University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Syed was born, raised, and trained in Chicago, Illinois, and we are lucky to have her here in Alma. Um, she has a passion for bringing, uh, bringing up-to-date big city medicine to underserved communities. Welcome, Dr. Syed. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So today, um, I will be talking about uh, women's issues in COVID, in a COVID world. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was pregnancy. Um, all the things that have changed as far as uh, COVID goes in pregnancy. Um, you know, the first thing being like delivery and the birth plan. Um, a lot of women have unfortunately not been able to have more than one person in the delivery room. I think when this, sorry. <laughs> um, I think when this first started, uh, no people were allowed in the delivery room in certain states. Um, and now, uh, as far as our local uh, hospitals go, at least one companion person is allowed to stay. Um, so it's, it's important to kind of plan for that. Um, it's not something that, you know, if, for example, if you have your husband with you, you can go in and out. Um, and that's just to prevent exposure to, to the staff and to, to you and, and things like that. So it's just a safety precaution. Um, another issue I was going to bring up is, you know, pregnancy and um, complications associated with COVID and, and getting COVID. Um, there, there has been research done uh, as far as passing COVID in utero to the baby. Um, and, you know, there's not much evidence that suggests, that suggests that. It's mostly there's early transmission because of early exposure right after birth. Um, so because of that, we are um, seeing women, you know, even giving birth and the whole uh, process of birth wearing a mask. And it's hard to imagine 
um, giving birth just, you know, in general, but then wearing a mask makes it a little tougher. So those are just some things to prep yourself for. Um, that's what you would expect to do um, when you're going in to deliver. Um, uh, breastfeeding as well, like you're going to breastfeed. Um, breastfeeding is totally um, still indicated even if mom does have COVID. Um, there's no evidence at this time that uh, COVID can be transmitted through the breast milk. Um, so moms are just encouraged to wear their mask, just like you would anything else. Um, so, and you know, the question was posed, well, are pregnant women high risk? And are they considered the high risk category um, when working? And it's really just the same precautions a pregnant woman would take during the flu season. Um, you're going to wear your PPE. Um, you know, I in, in my department, if someone is pregnant, I would prefer that a non-pregnant woman go in to maybe do something uh, that's an aerosolized or high-risk procedure. So if that's possible, then definitely we make those accommodations. But there's no evidence to suggest that, you know, if you're not using, if you're using your PPE, that you're at higher risk. Um, women with older children um, are, are deemed to be a little bit higher risk in actually um, getting and contracting COVID, COVID only because kids are, as we know, the vectors, you know, they have all sorts of germs. So that's the only reason. And, and for that reason, it's a little bit extra precaution and just being cognizant of that, um, and you, using more hand sanitizer, or washing your hands, things like that. So um, home deliveries are actually occurring at higher rates across the country because um, people are afraid to go to the hospital. And, you know, if you were going to plan a home birth anyway, and all is going normal with your pregnancy, that's great. Um, but I don't encourage, you know, you changing your delivery plan to stay home because you're afraid to go to the hospital. Honestly, the hospital is actually very safe to be in right now because we are so vigilant um, in making sure that we're reducing reducing exposure and transmission. At it's, in my opinion, you're more likely to get it at the grocery store, for example. Um, so, you know, don't don't uh, stop yourself from coming in because you're afraid that you know you'll be exposed to COVID. I think everybody in this field is very aware at this time and taking all the precautions necessary. Um, so I'll move on to preventative medicine and how it relates to women. Um, the number one thing that came to my mind was mammograms. Um, people have been delaying their mammograms and preventative care because they're afraid again to go to the hospital uh, to get the treatments that they need. Um, I would not, you know, suggest doing that. Uh, we're still doing at Summit, we're doing routine mammograms that are supposed to um, uh, be scheduled for women. So uh, please schedule those, go in for your gynae exams, um, all of the, the preventative things that you need to do, please do that. Um, it's, it's definitely not something you want to put on the back burner. And from a medical perspective, you know, I am seeing a lot of patients, unfortunately, that um, I'm diagnosing first-time cancers in people in the ER. and. You know, that's preventable. If you had symptoms months ago, you know, and you're presenting now, unfortunately, we could have gotten you care sooner. So please don't um, hesitate. Call your primary care. Come to the ER if you need to. We are always happy to take care of you. Um, the, the next thing I was going to talk about is um, immune boosting uh, strategies. I was asked to talk about that, um, especially in this COVID, COVID world that we're living in. Um, and some of these subjects have been kind of touched by, you know, the previous speakers. So I'm hoping to kind of give you more of a medical perspective on diet and exercise and things like that, uh, things you can do and why it's necessary to do that um, from a medical level. Um, so, you know, the first thing, of course, as everyone else has talked about, diet is so incredibly important. Um, and I say this because there are diets that are very high in saturated fat um, that can lead to uh, the inflammatory process. So what we know about COVID right now is that things called cytokines um, that uh, are associated with the inflammatory process in the body um, are leading to lung injury and other uh, vascular damage in, in the body. And so um, to prevent that, you know, we do what we can and, and advise what we can do to kind of, you know, soften the blow, if you will. Um, and diets, so whole food, and I say mostly plant-based, um, it's very difficult to do 100% plant-based, and I recognize that. Um, and you should really try not to eliminate anything that's going to set you up for, you know, failure. So if, if you love your steak, have your steak, you know, eat it sometimes, you know, don't go crazy with it. Um, red meat um, and animal fats have been associated with high saturated fat. So avoiding that, um, you know, or, de or decreasing that consumption and focusing on 
whole grains and vegetables. And Sarah kind of touched, you know, a lot on this, and she's absolutely right. You know, whole foods are very important to to concentrate on. Um, and you know, there's studies that are actually coming out now. Um, uh, one of the studies that came out uh, last month um, in the clinical translation of al allergies um, is basically COVID and diet, um, the, the relationship to diet. And, you know, people who have a high saturated fat diet, they, complain, they compared different parts of um, Europe, so France and um, Italy, for example, and the consumption of high saturated fats. And people who consume those had a uh, more significant effect um, after they did contract COVID. So those were the people that we were we were seeing on the news that were on ventilators and such. So, you know, it's diet is something that we don't talk about much um, when it comes to medicine, but it's absolutely necessary um, to focus on that. Um, and then, you know, everyone else has also touched on exercise and, you know, from a medical perspective, the reason exercise is so important is it's also very good for lung health. and. The uh, Association for Lung, um, for the American Lung Association, uh, recommends exercise for specifically COVID and to, to keep your lungs incredibly healthy. Um, we know right now, as far as COVID goes, um, there the, the biggest complication is lung injury, um, and when you have inflammation in your lung, um, you know you're just you're decreasing the capacity of your lungs to begin with. So. You know, exercising your lungs, um, keeping them inflated regularly, um, decreases the uh, the inflammation surrounding that. So, um, exercising also is is related to um, the increased production of innate immune cells. That's one thing we know, and it affects your gut bacteria. So, the gut bacteria obviously has a big role in your immune system as well. Um, even a little bit of exercise every day, and in, uh, like it was said before, if you're not used to exercising, just start with 10 minutes a day. Whatever you can do for yourself, it will go a long way in the end. Um, smoking, um, you know, smoking on a kind of molecular, like physiologic level, we all know smoking is bad for you, don't smoke. Whether it be cigarettes or marijuana, it takes a, a hit on your lungs. Um, there's tiny sacs in our lungs called alveoli, and those are the things that get damaged when, when you get COVID. Um, when you smoke, all of those alveoli are getting damaged, and so when you do contract COVID, you have less to work with, if that makes sense. Um, so increasing your lung capacity, again, um, keeping your lungs as healthy as possible um, is one of the things that you can do to help yourself. So, you know, it may not 100% decrease the possibility of you getting COVID, um, but it will definitely help you if you did, if you did in fact get it. Um, alcohol consumption, you know, mo moderate alcohol consumption is okay, um, but when you increase it um, past uh, the amounts that are recommended, um, you will cause more inflammatory changes to your body and including your lungs. So another thing to, to do is to decrease that. Um, and sleep, of course. Sleep is... Uh, Sleep, of course, we all know is this so, so important. I mean, it decreases so many things as far as your cortisol levels and, and things like that. But on a molecular level, there are so many studies done on poor sleep and how it disrupts the immune system. Um, it actually interferes with the disease fighting factors, like so the entire like inflammatory cascade that we have in our bodies. Um, and, and again, those cytokines, those cytokines have been talked about so much in the news, they're incredibly important. And they're like the key players in this inflammatory process um, that happens with COVID. So resting, um, it definitely improves recovery. So if you have a full night's sleep, regular sleep, sleep habits and good sleep hygiene, um, you know, if you did get COVID, it's going to help you to recover faster. And the last thing I have here to talk about is immunizations. Please, please get your flu shot. I know it's not directly related to COVID, but getting your flu shot, studies are showing right now that getting your flu shot is triggering your body to produce like broad-based infection-fighting molecules uh, for your immune system. So it may not help you specifically to not get COVID, but it will help you to defend against it when in fact, in fact you do get it or if you get it. Um, and, but, and there's peer review studying studies going on right now as we speak. They haven't been completely peer-reviewed, but they're undergoing and they have a substantial amount of data um, regarding the, the flu shot. Um, so, so that's, you know, essentially in a nutshell, take care of yourself. I know mental health has been discussed 
Um, as women, especially, I know that we take a lot of stress onto ourselves because we, um, you know, feel like it's our duty to kind of keep the family together. And in times like this, mental health is so important. Don't feel guilty for having to reach out. Um, I am seeing a lot of uh, depression in the ER, a lot of um, anxiety, and it's all rightfully so. Um, reach out if you need help. You know, 24-7 we are here in the ER if you need anything. Um, if you have any thoughts of hurting yourself, please reach out and ask someone. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Syed. We are so fortunate to have you as our medical director for the ER. Um, I know um, many of us in the community hope to never see you, but if we do, if we do have to come to the ER, we're so lucky that you're in charge. Um, we already had some qu questions pouring in. Um, one, what are some quick tips we can do today to boost our immune system? Is that um, drinking orange juice? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say go on a multivitamin. Um, vitamin D has been shown to um, have positive effect in actually having decreased symptoms and um, less severity when, you, it, when, in fact, you do get COVID. Unfortunately, where we live now, I bet you all of us have a vitamin D deficiency. Um, I know I did when I first moved here from Chicago. So um, I think that, you know, that's definitely something you can do. A multivitamin is very easy to pick up. Um, and uh, vitamin D also, uh, vitamin D3 is, is probably one of the better things to pick up and you know that's something you can do for yourself. Um, sleep and exercise are things you can immediately start and it, that's you know th those are those are quick things and even a little bit will go a long way for you. Great, thank you. Let's see what's next. Um, I've heard that many pregnant couples choose not to make any non-required appointments like finding out the sex of their baby um, because it requires an extra ultrasound at the height of the pandemic. Do you think it's safe for pregnant women to have elective medical treatment during COVID? Pregnant women, absolutely. Well, absolutely. It's safe. And uh, to that question about the ultrasound, the sex, that's during the anatomic survey at 20 weeks. And I do not recommend skipping that. Okay. Um, that is something that's very necessary for prenatal care. Um, that's the time that we are able to, yes, we can find out gender. You don't have to find out the gender gender. You can say, skip that. Don't tell me the gender if you want a surprise. Um, but what it's doing is actually looking at all the parts of the fetus, um, including the placenta and the umbilical cord, which are, as we know, very, very important to know ahead of time. So if there was an abnormality, we can plan for that um, for the safety of mom and baby. So I, I definitely don't recommend um, skipping those type of things. All the prenatal care that we are seeing is very important. Great, thank you. And I do want to just echo what you said earlier is that some people think, oh, it shouldn't go to the hospital because we're about extra germs during COVID. But as you mentioned, um, the hospital is actually a very safe place to be. So we want to encourage you to come in for these appointments. Absolutely, yes. Um, and then one, looks like one last question. You mentioned the flu shot. Um, is it too late to get our flu shot? When is it too late? I know with flu season, there are different, um, there's sort of a peak of it and we recommend having already had it, but um, what if someone says, oh shoot, I forgot about that. Can I still get mine? What if I go in two weeks or three weeks? Oh, absolutely. Yes, so. please get it. It's never too late. No, cool. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Syed. We You're really welcome. appreciate you being here and all the service you provide at Summit. Thank you. So that concludes our presentations for this evening, but we're not finished yet. We still have more to come. Um, next up, I am pleased to introduce our brand new Chief Nursing Officer here at Summit Pacific, um, our own Tori Bernier. And Tori is going to speak about the various health services we offer. Um, but first, some interesting or some, some background and some bio on Tori. She comes to us with more than 38 years of healthcare experience. Wow, we're so lucky she's here. Um, Tori has extensive experience and knowledge in hospital and nursing operations in both critical access hospitals and large health systems. In her past roles, she worked to improve quality and safety, emergency preparedness, community and population health, and service line development. Tori and her husband, Dick, enjoy golf and spending time with friends and family and volunteering for their church. Um, Tori is also actively involved in some community boards, including the Ronald McDonald House and United Way. Um, Tori and Dick look forward to joining the community and serving Grace Harbor. Welcome, Tori. We're so Hi. lucky to have you. Hi. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, um, that was 
very gracious and I appreciate uh, the time and that everyone has hung in there throughout the night um, for this women's uh, summit. I appreciate it. I um, want to go over a few things that we have to offer and you can always find these on our website. Uh, we have uh, a lot of things to offer women in our community. Um, one of them is uh, general gynecology. We have uh, providers that uh, provide that service here. We have cancer screening, clinical uh, breast health exams, family planning. We have a DEXA bone density uh, scanner, and I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, body composition studies, 3D mammography, ultrasound, uh, osteoporosis and joint and bone health. We have physical therapy and pelvic floor therapy, which is a really awesome thing to offer for our community. It's uh, not very often a small community like us have, have that to offer. Uh, we have prenatal services, and we have uh, procedures like colposcopies, EMB, and pessary. I always say that wrong. Um, let's see. Nope, other way. All right, so I did want to highlight a couple of things that our um, foundation uh, helped us with, and that's the 3D mammography. Um, it really changes lives, and you're able to see uh, so much uh, better sooner. Um, and get that treatment sooner. Yeah. And then the other thing is the DEXA bone density scan. So uh, for those women who have osteoporosis, um, this is really a game changer for them. They can uh, get the diagnosis that they need and get the treatment that they need. And um, so again, the foundation helped us get that uh, DEXA scan and we're greatly appreciating it. All right, I want to say thank you to everybody for uh, your time, and I'm really happy to be in Elma serving uh, the community. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for being with us, Tori. We appreciate it. And um, to all of you in the community, keep an eye out for Tori Bernier, our brand new Chief Nursing Officer. We're grateful you're here. <laughs> thank you. Cool winners. So, our next item is a basket by Host Defense Healthy Living. It's a gift basket. Um, it includes Fungi Perfecti Host Defense My Mycobotanicals Women Hormonal Balance Capsules. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Um, a colleague of mine actually recommended these and said that they are terrific. It also includes this Host Defense Peppermint Immune Boosting Support Spray and a paperback book titled Myco Medicinals and Informational Trees on Mushrooms. And this, I understand, was written by an expert with over 20 years in the field. Um, and it details the health benefits of more than 17 species of mushrooms. Interesting. Didn't realize mushrooms were so beneficial to immune health. So let's find out who's the winner of this Myco Botanicals gift basket. All right. And Ashley Perrin of Montefano, we will contact you to let you know how to get your gift basket. Congratulations. And don't go anywhere. We still have more gifts. Next up, just move this over here, is our breast cancer awareness traveler tote and gift assortment. And I understand um, this is a really cute little pink and black tote. It comes with a 2021 monthly planner, a lapel pin, um, cushioned ankle socks, Solara water bottle, Allure manicure set, stretchy bracelet. I understand there's a coffee mug in there and a bunch more things. So let's find out who wins our breast health awareness um, bag or bag. Okay, I'm mixing them up, and our winner is. Donna Baker, also of Montefano. Donna will contact you to um, figure out how to get you your gift bag. Congratulations. And surprise, we actually have a second one of these Express Health Awareness gift bags. So our next and final raffle winner for tonight is, drum roll, Crystal Newman of Aberdeen. Crystal will contact you as well to find out how to pick up or um, receive your gift bag. Congratulations to all our raffle winners and thank you so much for participating and registering for our event tonight. Oops. Ooh, technical difficulty here. We need that. 
Perfect. Okay, and that concludes our evening. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thank you for our presenting sponsors, Amerigroup and Vaughn Company. We hope that you learned some interesting information, took away some tools and some little nuggets of information. Um, again, all of these slides will be on our website and we'll include them in our follow-up email that will go out, um, if not tomorrow, early next week, um, as well as the link to the United Healthcare San Bello app um, for mental health. Thank you all so much for participating. I hope you have a happy and healthy holiday season. Stay well.